Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Boone's Ferry. I woke up in a great mood this morning and uh, walked into church and felt all excited until I found out that someone literally ran over my sermon in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I manuscript my sermon. I usually don't even use it because otherwise it gets all stilted. I try to say what I actually wrote rather than just preach. But uh, yeah, it's funny. So is this your sermon? And I was like, yeah, I think it actually is. Now that it <laughs> If we were the superstitious type, this would be the worst of omens for someone. <laughs> but we're not. Um, I only have one announcement today, and uh, I'm just going to say this for the next four Sundays in a row. Uh, If you've been here, you know all about it. We're doing a 24-hour prayer time where we're literally praying together for 24 hours. Uh, I don't know that any individual person, unless you are uh, crazy, is going to pray for 24 hours straight, although I think there are people signed up for like four-hour blocks or something like that, Uh, but that's on November 5th all the way through November 6th, so November 5th at 5 p.m. right here in the prayer room. Uh, there'll be a coffee machine with, uh, you know, it's like the Nespresso pod, so there's unlimited coffee. We'll have the uh, fridge fully stocked and um, the entire prayer room completed at that time. We're still, still sort of under construction. Um, and people are signing up already, and people are signing up for the middle of the night kind of hours, 3 to 4 p.m., 1 to 4 p.m., all those different kinds of hours. So you can go on our website, uh, a.m., sorry, not p.m. <clears throat> I see Ben laughing whenever I say something inaccurate, so I know I've messed up. Uh, you can sign up online, just go to our website and go to prayer, and it's really simple. It says sign up now, and you'll be able to see all the different slots. Also, by the way, if you think, you know what, I don't know if I can get up that early in the morning, if you set yourself an alarm and want to just get on Zoom, you could join via Zoom. It's both in person and on Zoom that we're going to be, and I'll probably even be joining some hours on Zoom and checking in with people and, and praying with them. And um, if you're on Zoom, you wouldn't necessarily have to be there for the entire hour. Might be encouraging just to check in, pray for 15 minutes, go right back to sleep. Or go right back to watching whatever Netflix show you were watching. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for you to join in on prayer. Uh, Maybe you have mobility issues, maybe you live far away. Uh, God doesn't not hear you just because you're Zooming in from uh, from a computer screen. Um, But we're excited. We're working on a prayer guidance page, and I'm also going to be putting out about a 30-minute video to just give you some instruction in terms of um, how the whole thing is going to work, so you can look forward to that on our YouTube channel. So yeah, if you're you're interested, sign up. You can invite your friends to sign up. We don't really have a whole lot of rules for signing up, but we're really excited what God's going to do through that. Um, With that being said, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke 19. We're in chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke, moving right along, and we're going to be working through verses 11 through 27, a relatively famous parable called the Parable of the Ten Minas. And before we even get into God's Word, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, I have a very simple and yet profound prayer that someone taught me a long time ago, another preacher. And that is that you would open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I actually want a show of hands. Um, This isn't a test of any kind. I'm I'm really just curious. How many of you have seen that show, Alone? It's just titled Alone, and it's on Netflix and on Hulu. It's kind of like Survivor, but hardcore. Hardly any of you. One more over here. Yeah. um, If you haven't, I highly recommend it. The, it's, it's relatively wholesome TV. Uh, you know, the, the only thing that I would might disclaim on is there's some language every once in a while, but even that is either bleeped out or very uh, far and few between. Alone is like Survivor, but hardcore. What Alone is, is, uh, the, you know, the first time I got introduced to it was season six. There's been a bunch of seasons before that and a couple since. And uh, I think this is the Northern Territories of Canada. They drop 10 of these people off, and they are truly alone. They've been trained on how to do their own camera work. They set up cameras on trees. They do, you know, selfie work. And, and I, I don't know if you know, but Arctic tundra is what you need to think about when you think about the Northern Territories. So they're dropped off. I'm not sure exactly when. It's before winter, though. It's still already, you know, about 32 degrees. So it's already really, really cold when they get there. And they, the, ga- the name of the game is really simple, survive for the longest, survive for the longest. And they really do mean survive. So the only time they have any human contact, I think is 
once every three weeks or something like that for these wellness checks. They send in a medical crew, and the medical crew tests how much weight they've lost and their fat percentage and things like that. And if they've lost too much, they pull them. Like they're literally starving to death, and they pull them. And people have stayed out that long. People were that tough. And just, uh, I think one person stayed out for 70 days and hadn't been eating in weeks and was just emaciated and was all upset when she got pulled. That's how tough she was. It's just tough as nails. She was weeping because she was getting pulled. She could have stayed out longer, she thought, but they do actually care about the safety of the participants. And um, I've been watching this, and you get 10 items, 10 items you can choose. And most of the, and it, it doesn't include everything, so I don't think clothing's included. You know, they get to have all the clothing and the sleeping bag and, th and, and things like that. But like, there's, there's not a tent, it's a tarp that they, that they may get. And two tarps would be two items, right? Although a bow and arrows, I think, is just still one item. Uh, people will take an ax or a saw or like a multi-tool that's an ax and a saw. Uh, sometimes people take paracord. A lot of people these days have been taking paracord because they've seen in other seasons how well people have used it. Uh, they'll make gill nets out of it. I don't know if you know what a gill net is. Just imagine a net that's kind of rectangular that you set down in the water. And uh, people that have used gill nets are really effective at catching, catching fish. And the fish in the northern territories of, at the lake that they were at, they're massive. Trout like this size, I'm not exaggerating. Like the fins alone were just, you know, when you leave uh, trout alone for a long time, they grow really large. So it's fun watching them catch trout. Um, just this most recent se uh, um, season, somebody went and hunted for a musk ox, and they killed a musk ox, but uh, the arrow didn't take it down, and they had to go in like coarse quarters with a knife. It was the craziest thing. Imagine being all alone fighting a musk ox with just a knife after your arrow failed. And... Uh, so it's just, it's just unreal. Like I said, it's not, it's not games like in Survivor. I used to watch Survivor, and I liked it. Just kind of stopped watching. But alone is really intense. And uh, then the Arctic hits, and it's like nev negative 17 degrees. And I don't know if you've ever uh, been on a diet and lost weight, but you immediately start being more sensitive to temperature when you lose quite a bit of weight like that. So these people are emaciated and freezing in their little huts. And then they make their fires bigger because they want to be warmer and end up catching their huts on fire. That happens at least once a season. Someone will catch their, uh, their little hut on fire. Um, however, the most recent season, I'm going to say the person that won in case you're getting all excited about this show uh, so that I don't, don't uh, ruin anything. But the person that won could have stayed much longer. The person was cold, freezing, but had enough food to survive for longer, was talking about going all the way through this, the winter into the spring. And that person was totally surprised when the camera crew came to him saying, hey, you're the last person standing. You know, the last, you're the last one on loan. And I think it was either 500,000 or a million dollars that they won, and it was 100 days in the Arctic tundra. 100 days with just 10 items. This person was thriving, or thriving. So I thought about that, and I thought about this particular passage and the idea that, A, what Jesus is calling us to do through this parable is not happening in harsh conditions, but in abundance. God says that he gives us, through his great and precious promises, everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness. So it's not the Arctic tundra. Also, it's not alone. It's not alone serving Jesus, not alone at all. And it's not just 10 items that you get. You get all the promises and you get all the benefits of the kingdom. We're going to be talking about all the different ways that God has blessed us and gifted us to serve him. And yet, human beings are able to thrive for more than 100 days and beyond. When you, if you ever watch season 7, you can tell. It, it's totally true. The person could have definitely survived longer. While everyone else was nearly starved to death and just barely hanging on, this person was thriving. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. So if human beings, just literally in their own power, can thrive in the Arctic tundra, what would it be like if God, if you, if you knew and really believed that God had gifted you and blessed you and given you opportunities and influence and a station in life to serve him with, that if you're just being faithful, it's impossible not to thrive. And you're not all alone. Just because you're part of a church and just because you're... Um, here in Tualatin does not mean that you might not feel lonely. I'm not trying to diminish that. It also doesn't mean that you may not feel like you're financially strained or not have enough, but my 
guess, and I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm right about this, is that you can't remember the last time you went hungry and didn't have access to food, or the last time you were thirsty and didn't have access to water or some kind of drink, or the last time you were freezing cold and didn't have access to warmth and clothing. That does not mean that there are not people who are poor and are in need of those things, and uh, we can talk about that a little bit later in the service when we talk about the application of what it looks like to serve the Lord here in Tualatin and in this church. <clears throat> but for most of us, we're not starving. We're not struggling in those kinds of ways in terms of provision. We have everything we need for life and godliness, everything we have to serve him and to devote our lives to things of eternal value. And so I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the fact that you have been set up in every way you could possibly set up, each one of you, as long as you're not comparing yourselves to others, will find just a whole treasure trove of ways that God has blessed you and gifted you and given you opportunity and influence and a station in life, all kinds of different ways to be productive in his kingdom. And there is time yet to be productive in his kingdom. And that's actually one of Jesus' concerns as he's telling this parable. You'll remember we just got done reading about Zacchaeus, a man who came to faith and proved or gave evidence of his faith by becoming obedient again to the Old Testament, a chief tax collector turned genuine Christian. Really cool story. And in the last verse, Jesus says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is verse 10 of chapter 19, to seek and save the lost. But Jesus knows people don't understand, even who, those who believe that he's the Messiah, that him coming to seek and save the lost is going to look very different than what they were expecting from prophecies from their Bible at the time, which we now know as the Old Testament. So verse 11, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. And now he gives you the purpose. Luke gives us the purpose of the parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear. We're going to stop right there for a moment. I'll keep reading after this. But this is so important. If you don't understand the purpose and the reason why Jesus told this parable, um, there are still some things you could probably understand from this, especially if you're thinking about a similar parable, the parable of the talents that you can find in Matthew, and I think it's Matthew 25. But that parable was told for a different purpose. There are significant detailed differences, and the application is significantly different as well, uh, although there are similarities. This parable is told because Jesus is drawing near to Jerusalem, and Jews at that time that had studied their prophecies and studied what the scripture says about who the coming Messiah is and who, what he was going to do, believed that the Messiah, as he comes near to Jerusalem, is going to become king, take over Jerusalem, from Jerusalem take over the rest of the world and establish the kingdom. Not just regain regional dominance for Israel, but global dominance. I actually want to show you a verse that says this in um, Zechariah. And I thought I had a, uh, <clears throat> I thought I, it's Zechariah 14, I forgot to put my tab, so I'm going to take a second to, uh, there it is, Zechariah 14, verse 9, there's a prophecy about the Messiah, and the Lord will be king over all the earth, on that day the Lord will be one and his name one. This is just one example, you can go to Isaiah, you can go to to uh, Malachi, you can go to Daniel, you can go to all the different places in the Bible where the prophets prophesied about this coming king, about this Messiah who would rule and reign forever on the throne of David. He was going to be a descendant of David. And so some people had figured out that this is Jesus. And they believed, in a sense, faithfully from the Old Testament that he was actually going to set up a government on earth. What they missed and what they did not understand, and it wasn't just the Pharisees that didn't understand this, even the disciples didn't understand this, was there were going to be two comings, two separate comings, one to seek to save the lost and another one to establish his kingdom. I want to reiterate the idea that believing that Jesus will establish his kingdom on earth is a faithful view of biblical prophecy. It just did not happen the way they expect it. Here's Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such as the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That is a prophecy connected to an Old Testament prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled. When Jesus came the first time, when the Messiah came the first time, he came to seek and save the lost, specifically 
to atone for the sins of the world, to make a way for forgiveness to be just. So as he's coming to Jerusalem, there's a whole lot of expectation that he's coming as the coming king. He's been doing all this teaching and all this healing, but now we're going to get to the real stuff. He's going to overthrow the crooked government. Uh, he's going to overthrow the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire, and from there it's going to spread to the whole world, and he's going to make all things right, and they believe that was going to be right now because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. You see what I'm saying? They believed that the kingdom of God was going to appear right at that time, and they missed something about the kingdom of God. Turns out over and over and over again, even in Luke, Jesus teaches things like this. Luke 17, verse 20, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, and he's talking about himself. So the kingdom of God being in the midst of us is Jesus Christ, yet none of you can see Jesus Christ right now. So you have to think, well, what is the kingdom of God? And it gets misdefined quite a bit and more and more these days, but I want to define it for you using scripture. Verse for, uh, chapter 14 of Romans says this, this is Paul speaking, who was uh, commissioned by Jesus to preach authoritatively as apostle, so it might as well just be Christ's words too. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. Maybe one more verse about the kingdom of God from Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 4, and I think it was verse 12. No, verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can see the idea of seeking and saving the lost was making a way for their repentance to be real, for them to say, I was wrong, I'm wrong with God, I'm wrong with others, I need forgiveness. I know the penalty of sin is death and condemnation, but in Jesus Christ, at this time they didn't fully understand that, but the gospel says that Jesus died for our sins so that we don't have to. There's a substitution happening there. It's the mystery hidden for ages past. Nobody knew that God himself the Son of God was going to have to die for sin, and that would be the only way that people could be atoned for. But if you put these passages together, that the kingdom cannot be observed, that it's not about food, and in that case, Paul was talking about how people were having some disunity around what foods to eat and what it actually looks like to be a mature Christian, thinking about those things. But it's, it's not something that you can see, handle, taste, or touch. It can't be observed in that way. It's already in your midst, and he was talking about himself, so it's about Jesus, and it's about peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. A very simple but very faithful biblical uh, definition of the kingdom of God is Jesus ruling in the hearts of his people by his Holy Spirit. Jesus ruling in the hearts of his people by his Holy Spirit, and the growth of that rule. And I don't really mean the growth of that rule as in it's spreading out in numbers, although that is part of it, but it's the idea that more of, more of your heart would be surrendered to King Jesus, that he'd be on the throne. And you know how often you get this throne in your heart, you say, hey, I'm going to take you off that throne for this day. I'm going to put myself on that, or somebody else, or something else on that throne, and you side skirt away from Jesus' rule, because Jesus' rule it's sacrificial. It requires you to love God and others in a sacrificial manner, and it's painful. You have to give things up, but it's also supported by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you're very flesh. The thing that wants to rule in you and the Holy Spirit are sent, set against each other, even at war. And the difference between the Holy Spirit winning and your flesh winning is you surrendering to the Holy Spirit, because he doesn't do it by force. Remember in the, in the show Aladdin, how... Um, the genie says that uh, grant pretty much any wish, but I can't um, cause someone to love you. Why can't you cause somebody to love you? Well, the moment that you apply force to love, it ruins love. There has to be a degree of freedom in actually loving people. And so it's not that this genie um, isn't all powerful. It's that there are rules that even th that once you apply power and force to, it, it destroys the very thing that you're trying to go for. So the Holy Spirit, I like to think of him as a gentleman. And he can be forceful at times, but I like to think of him changing our hearts voluntarily, causing us to desire things we didn't desire before voluntarily. It's almost magical at times. I wouldn't use the word magic. I would use the word supernatural, but it's like he just goes, whoosh, 
and your desires changed, and it's really yours. But what happened right before that is you said, change my heart, Lord, change my heart. So again, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is Jesus ruling in our hearts through his Holy Spirit. Jesus ruling in our hearts through his Holy Spirit. People get this wrong in a lot of different ways, and they get it wrong along the exact same lines that the disciples and the Pharisees got it wrong back in that day and age. And that is that they begin to believe that the kingdom of God is about the changing and betterment of systems or traditions or social norms or institutions. And although you'll see that the kingdom of hearts in Jesus' people, I mean... Imagine, uh, I think there was a story of, the, um, of a, a CEO, he might have not been the 7-Eleven CEO, but the CEO of 7-Eleven became um, a Christian and he stopped uh, selling pornographic magazines in his, in his stores. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the details are right, but that did really happen to a store with a, C, a CEO and it was a, a big chain of stores, convenience stores like that. And so yeah, systems... Traditions, social norms, and institutions will change when people within them let Jesus rule in their hearts. But to go and try to change that institution without heart change, that's not the kingdom. How can you know that? Well, it's observable. You can see it. You can touch it. You can see the change. But not only that, there's a, a foolishness to these new doctrines coming out that basically say it's us that bring the kingdom to earth. So we make God's kingdom come on earth the way it is in heaven through our work and through our actions. And you can see there's an attractiveness to that and a seeming biblicalness, but there is also a lot of foolishness and even some arrogance in the idea that we're the ones that inaugurate God's kingdom or that we're the ones that effectuate it. Again, it's Jesus through the Holy Spirit in our hearts. It's by his power. Do you have any power to change someone's heart, to make them want to be pure and have their business be pure? Can laws do that? Laws are here to chaperone and create a society that has, uh, there, there's, a, there's an infrastructure of law that keeps people safe and that people abide by. I think that's the, uh, what we mean by the social contract. We agreed to stop at stop signs. If you all of a sudden didn't, it'd be mayhem. People would get run over and run into. And so law and order is important, but the purpose of the law is not to transform hearts because it can't. Again, it's the Aladdin thing. The law cannot transform someone's heart. When you're forced to do something, when you just white-knuckle a rule, that doesn't mean that your heart has changed and you desire to. So the Spirit doesn't do that by force. And so we see that trying to change institutions by force is not the kind of thing that the Holy Spirit is into. But he is into ruling in the hearts of people. And that's Jesus ruling through the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people. Another aspect that makes it foolish to just devote your life to changing systems rather than to helping people surrender more and more to Jesus in their hearts is this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There are a lot of passionate Christians in my generation. I'm not actually sure that I that I count as a millennial, 1983, and I haven't really researched when it starts or not, but in that kind of millennial area, there are a lot of people that are, that are passionate, and they want to do good works, and they're passionate about good works, um, and although maybe they were raised in Christian families, they don't yet know the Bible as well as they think they do, and so they'll oftentimes get really passionate about changing institutions and doing good works within those institutions to change them, and they miss something, and that is that these institutions already have rulers and cosmic powers of this present darkness, spiritual, personal, spiritual forces of evil in the service of the enemy, principalities that are ruling these institutions. And you can see it because you'll watch these institutions degenerate into evil agendas that are far worse than the human flesh could even decide. You see things happen in governments and nations that, wow, that's, humans are really evil. Uh, yes, but it becomes twisted and corrupted in such a way you can actually see the enemy's presence. You have to be a spiritual person filled with the Spirit to understand that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And so our weapons aren't flesh and blood. And that doesn't just mean that they're not AK-47s and M-16s. It means that we don't fight the way the world fights for justice and righteousness and goodness. We recognize that it's a kingdom of hearts 
not a kingdom of man and not a kingdom of force and not a kingdom of laws and rules, but again, a kingdom of Jesus ruling in our hearts. So let's just say you spent your whole life trying to change one institution and you did a massive amount of good that's visible and observable and it's, it's, it's great and people are feeling great about it and then you pass on and a principality moves in to rule that institution again and just whoosh, all the good you did was gone. Well, that's not how it works with the kingdom of God. With the kingdom of God, the things that you accomplish in discipleship, the things you accomplish with your spiritual gifts, the things you accomplish in your relational influence and helping people understand who God is more, or encouraging them when they're down or discouraged, those things have eternal value. You can't see them. People's faces don't necessarily change, although I've noticed a certain countenance in those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. There's just a twinkle of joy in their eyes. I sometimes feel like I can tell when someone's a Christian or not. It's not always accurate, but the point is it's not really observable, not really observable. It's something that happens in someone's heart and their character and very nature and desires are changed from the inside out. And God gives us participation in that. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about kingdom work. And yes, it bleeds out into institutions. Uh, it turns out Jesus wasn't coming to conquer Rome, but the gospel did end up conquering Rome. There's a reason why it's called Roman Catholic. The church ended up conquering the Roman Empire, and it became Christian. And there were some good and some bad things that happened as a result of that. But again, to understand the kingdom of God, you have to understand that it is a spiritual kingdom first. But that does not mean that it won't be physical and literal in the future. So Jesus wants them to understand before he even gets in Jerusalem, especially his disciples, I'm not coming as the, the kind of king that you think. I think it was in the Gospel of John where the people were so excited about who Jesus was and they tried to make him king by force. And what did he do? He stiff-armed them. He said, no, it's not why I'm here. And you'll get that stiff arm too if you decide that you're going to try to bring the kingdom by force, that you're going to make the kingdom happen institutions, and that your good works are going to accomplish it rather than that that kingdom is the kingdom of hearts and of transformation into Christ-likeness that will result in transformation even in the world, but it's not what it's about. So that's the purpose of this parable. It was a little long-winded, I know, but that's the purpose of this parable. And he said, therefore, because that's the purpose, a nobleman went to the far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas. And he said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful and very little. You shall, serve, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. And the idea that he's uh, the well done, good and faithful servant, and you've been faithful and little and very little, it's implied. In that blessing. We're going to stop right there, verse 19. We'll pick up in verse 20 in just a minute. So, when it comes to parables, we've actually learned quite a bit together in Luke. Uh, parables are stories where there is a spiritual meaning where things in the parable stand for something else in real life that also has a spiritual meaning but isn't directly um, related to that story. And so, in this case, we have to decide well, who's the nobleman? Who are the servants? Who are the citizens? And who is the two good servants? And we'll find out in verse 20, there's a disloyal servant as well. We have to assign things to those. And we have to decide which things don't necessarily stand for things. And it's not always easy. It takes some skill in interpretation to understand this. In fact, there's a whole study when I went to seminary. You could pretty much get your own graduate degree in the interpretation of parables, and scholars have. So it's not easy. It's a vast field of study. At the same time, the Holy Spirit is an amazingly good teacher. And you're going to hear me assign spiritual, real values to these things. You'll be like, oh yeah, that's totally what it is. That's totally what it is. And this one's not as complicated as you might even think. And so who do you think Jesus is talking about when he says there's a nobleman that's going into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return? Well, he's talking about himself. And in this case, what will happen is Jesus will ascend to heaven. And then someday God the Father will send him back and his kingdom will be established. 
But in the meantime, there are people that are rejecting him. Who are those people? Are they only the Pharisees or everybody that rejects him? Well, I think at the time, very specifically, the Pharisees and Jews that wouldn't receive him as the Messiah. But as time goes on and God opens the gospel up to the Gentiles as well, it's anyone who won't receive Jesus, anyone who won't receive the king. Remember, they're not receiving him while he's gone off to go get the kingdom. And there are examples in history back then that people that were listening would be like, oh yeah, that's exactly what happens. King Herod had to go to a higher authority to get his kingdom. And then there were other kings that were rejected from getting kingship and coming, and coming back, and partly because some citizens complained and said, we do not want him over us as king. So they would have known, unlike us, we don't have a monarchy here and this idea that you would go to some far country, get a kingship, and then come back, get a title, get the rights, get the authority, and the blessing of the higher power, so to speak, the, the world power at the time, or the regional power. It's not something we recognize, but they were like, oh yeah, that's, we know, yeah, that makes sense to us. So the citizens who hated him, the spiritual meaning of that is it's the Pharisees and the Jews, but also anyone in the future that would do and he, when, he, when he had returned, he'd received that kingdom. He ordered these servants to whom he had given money to be called to him. Okay? And those servants, it says there were 10. And you think, well, why didn't he say 12? That would have been really neat because he was 12 disciples. And personally, I don't believe there is a value that we should assign to the 10. I think it's just a detail that he said 10 servants. If I had to guess at what, why 10, not 12, maybe if he had said 12, uh, then we would have thought only this only applies to the 12 apostles and doesn't apply to everyone. But a nice round number, you wouldn't even think of that. It's just anyone who was serving him. He had these servants. But I don't think in this case, and the, the, the parable doesn't say. It's good to just leave things that it's not clear about what we're talking about. But when they have obvious, you know, the kingdom of God and a nobleman who's looking for a kingdom, well, who's the one who's going to receive the kingdom? It's Jesus. It just makes sense. And now you know there are these two servants who've been sent to do business in this city, who sent to serve the Lord in this way. Notice one of the big differences between the talents is they, the talents were given out and one got five, one got two, and one got one. In this case, they all just get one mina. It says he gave them ten minas, there's ten servants. But if you want to be certain that each one only got one, the first came before him, verse 16, said, Lord, your mina has made ten minas. Only got one, made ten out of it. Ten X productivity in the city. And the nobleman says to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful with very little, you should have authority over ten cities. So you can already see, okay, Jesus isn't going into Jerusalem to become this conquering king who changes all these institutions and changes all the things. He's coming to rule in the hearts of people and to establish that through the cross in the first place, that the law would actually be written on their hearts. And it would be the law of the Spirit because their desire and the power to do it are both there. And those things were not true in the Old Testament. This is in fulfillment of prophecy in Ezekiel. And so he's telling them, look, I've got a plan for you. I've got some participation. I've got things for you to do while I'm gone, while I'm coming and ascending to heaven. This is how the disciples would have almost assuredly interpreted this. So he wants them to see it's going to be, you don't know how long it's going to be before I come back, but I've got a plan for you. I've got a mina for each one of you. I've got a gift. I've got opportunities. I've got influence. I've got station in life. I've got ways for you to serve the kingdom, and then I'll return and then I'm going to bless you for having been faithful in that. So your, lead, your mina has made five uh, more minas, and he gets five more cities. Your mina has made ten more minas, and he gets ten cities. In other words, there's a reward of even greater responsibility. That's how I would define that in our time right now. A reward of even greater responsibility. This really isn't about money, is it? But could it also be about money, among other things? Well, it's maybe one of the ways that God blessed you is that you're very wealthy and you can bless the kingdom and a church and uh, people who are living in poverty with that. Would that be a way to apply your mina? Of course. There's a lot of ways to define the mina in your life, and they're not the same for everyone. And we're going to be talking about a list of five things that you take with you in your mina. They're not exhaustive, but I think they're things that we can all relate to and start thinking about the areas where God has given us this mina to, for us to be faithful with and be productive until Jesus returns. So it's making sense. I hear a lot of smiles. I see a lot, hear a lot of smiles. I see a lot of smiles. You know, I see people understanding what is being said. And it's amazing. By the way, if you understand what this parable says, 
If you actually really understand what this parable says, it means the Holy Spirit dwells in you. These spiritual things cannot be understood by people unless they are themselves spiritual, meaning indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So you can rejoice in that if you're understanding this. But there's a negative side to this story as well. There's not just blessing for faithfulness with what's been given, but there's also consequence for unfaithfulness for not being faithful with what's been given. Verse 20, Then another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you do, did not sow. And he said, the nobleman, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming, I'm, and at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. So we have to make another interpretive decision here. Is what this man is actually saying about the nobleman true? Is he a severe man? Does he take what he did not deposit and reap what he did not sow? When you've got verses in the Bible that say, consider the kindness and severity of God. So it's not as though we can just say automatically there's no severity in how God uh, responds to evil. There definitely is. But in this case, the nobleman does not confirm the truth of the uh, wicked servant's words. He says, I'm going to take those words and I'm going to turn them on you. So you knew that I was this kind of person, huh? It's not admission that he's that kind of person. We'll talk about what kind of person the nobleman really is in a minute when it comes to the gifts that he gives, the power that he gives us to, to carry that out. He really doesn't reap where he does not sow. It's the total opposite. And lots of parables are the opposite of that too, calling Jesus the sower. But anyway, he takes this thing and turns it out, it's an excuse. Wait, so you're saying that you thought I was a severe man and that I was going to come take what I didn't even earn and work for and what I had nothing to do with and so what you decided is to hide that mina away. If you didn't want to do all the work because you felt like it was unfair, couldn't have you at least put it in the bank and then it would have gained interest? Could you not have just put it in the bank and then it would have gained interest? Yes, you could have. And so it turns out it's an excuse. And we have to realize that although, well, actually, let me back up. I don't believe that Jesus is a severe man who reaps what he didn't deposit. In other words, take the product that he didn't work. Is there anything you can accomplish in the kingdom of God for Jesus apart from his power? No, there's not. So he's helping you do it. He's not just, hey, do all this work because I want to get richer. That's not it at all. In fact, he doesn't even actually need your help. It's an honor for us to be blessed with that kind of purpose and participation in the kingdom. And on top of it, we know that he gives us at least one spiritual gift the moment we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we have to discover that gift, you have to figure that out, you have to be able to define it, and then you have to deploy it and put it into use. But the fact of the matter is that there's supernatural power that Jesus has given you through that gift to serve in his kingdom, to serve in a local church, right? So he's not like this person is saying, but he knows when someone's making an excuse. My dog ate the homework. He knows when someone's saying uh, something about how they were not able to serve or not able to do something that just isn't even true. And so we have to actually think about that. In this case, the person's excuse was some slanderous accusation against the nobleman's character, which he doesn't refute necessarily, but he uses it to prove that it's an excuse. You could have put it in the bank. So, I mean, maybe our excuse is exactly the same. We don't think God will actually help us to serve him. We think the thing that he's called us to or that sitting in front of us is too great of a problem. We don't think he'll help us. And so we just hide away the things that he's given us to actually work on that problem or work on that solution with. Maybe it is other things. Say, oh, I'm just too tired, I'm just too tired. There are things in the kingdom of God that have eternal value that take very little energy. You don't even have to get up. You can literally lay in bed, fold your hands, and begin praying for somebody. You couldn't have done that? Couldn't put that mean in the bank? You could. So... You might think, wow, man, people that don't allow any excuses and crack the whip like that, they're kind of harsh. But think about it another way. If you're Jesus and you know that you've blessed people with gifts and opportunity and a station in life and ways to participate in the kingdom of God, that will help them even recognize this is why I was created. It's such a powerful thing to know how God created you for good works in Christ Jesus in the kingdom. 
But on top of it, Jesus knows he's going to bless you for being faithful with that. But every single excuse will interrupt that blessing from happening because you hide your mina away. So he's really a good Lord to not allow any excuses. Just like a good parent doesn't allow their kids to make excuses. You need to hear a real sorry, not a sorry but, or it was an accident when you watched them do it three times on purpose. Right? No, you need to teach them, that's not how God works, so that's not how I'm going to work. I see you making excuses. You need to really own it. Nobody likes someone that will never own it. An apology that someone makes, they're like, well, I'm sorry you felt that way. It never really leads to reconciliation, does it? So Jesus isn't harsh in not allowing excuses. Now we also have to decide, you know what? Is this wicked servant someone who's actually ultimately saved or someone who's not? We discussed that in the discipleship community quite a bit. And the reason why you, you do need to kind of make a decision, and you can make a decision, three decisions. One, uh, no, he's wicked, he's not saved. Uh, well, he's wicked, but no, he's just kind of lapsed, and he, and he is, but there were consequences for his unfaithfulness. Or another middle one, you don't know. And by the way, oftentimes, when it's not clearly stated in the Bible, the best thing you can do interpreting is say, I don't know. A lot of mistakes are made when we don't say, I don't know, when there isn't clear evidence. So here's what I would say. There is evidence in the Bible for both types of categories. Not necessarily evidence that speaks to this particular verse, but let me give you evidence first from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about the possibility of someone being saved but having a life that is lived for the wrong uh, reasons. And this is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I keep turning to the wrong places. There we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'll start in verse 11. This is again Paul teaching. For no one can lay a foundation other that than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation for all work in church, for all work in the kingdom, is obviously the king. That's concrete. Nothing you're going to change that foundation. Now, if anyone builds on that foundation, which is Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, costly materials, valuable materials, or wood, hay, straw, very cheap materials, materials that don't last. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. What day? The day he returns. It's capitalized in the ESV. It's clearly that day. It's going to be exposed on judgment day because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive reward. Well, gold, silver, precious stones survive that kind of fire. Wood, hay, straw, gone. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire, by the skin of your teeth. And you could see how somebody is a genuine Christian. They really believe that Jesus died and rose again for the atonement of their sin and for the hope of their eternal life. But their preaching and teaching or the work that they do or the agenda that they lived in their life had nothing to do with the gospel and going and making disciples. You might even know a Christian who you think, yeah, I think they're a believer, but they really are doing their own thing in life. Or you think somebody, could it be that someone was an alcoholic, came to faith, real faith, was saved, had some transformation, relapsed, fell back into alcoholism? Yeah, it could. That can totally happen. So we get examples, and we have to be careful and discerning just because we see someone's lifestyle not matching up with what the gospel says does not necessarily mean that they're not saved, but there's going to be a terrible consequence for living a life that the only thing that can be said about is that it was built on the foundation, but everything that was built on the foundation was wood, hay, and straw. It wasn't really what the Bible teaches. It wasn't really the character God wanted to build. But then there's another one, and I've heard people call this the scariest verse in the whole Bible. I don't actually think it is because it's not uh, mysterious what needs to be uh, believed by faith to be saved. This is Jesus speaking. Sermon on the Mount, most famous sermon ever. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does, the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So you can see both. You could see someone that just escaping the flames by the skin of their teeth and all the work that they thought they were doing for the Lord 
meaningless, but they're saved. And you can see someone who thought they were working for their whole life for the name of Jesus. Turns out Jesus never knew them. They weren't even worshiping or following the genuine Jesus. You see this in a lot of the kind of Christian, pseudo-Christian hybrid cults and sects and almost even world religions that are, that are just redefining who Jesus is in a way that isn't faithful biblically. So which one is this? Well, some of you said it said he's a wicked servant. That really makes me think, you know, God doesn't call his children wicked servants, and I would agree with that. And I would lean towards that direction. Uh, it's, however, really interesting. It says here at the very last verse, but as for these enemies of mine, and he's talking about first that wicked servant who wasn't building on that foundation, uh, and then comparing them to the wicked servants, or the wicked citizens. And then he says, but as for these servants of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Something he doesn't say about that wicked servant. So you can see, there's just back and forth. If you read the parable of the talents, it is obvious that the wicked servant belongs to those who Jesus will say, I never knew you. He actually says so. But in this case, he doesn't. And that's interesting. It's a different parable. And in this case, Jesus does not define who he is. And so where I land as a preacher in a Bible interpretation, is it doesn't tell us. It doesn't say. I lean towards wicked servants. Probably not. Especially we have this other parable that's similar. Probably not. But again, he doesn't define it. So I think it's just fine to say we don't know. And actually what that allows for, if you're thinking about, you know, why did Jesus write this or tell this parable the way he does, is maybe it's actually good for you to have a little uncertainty about the idea of being completely unfruitful in your life. There may be some here, there may be some Christians who really believe they're Christians, but are living a completely fruitless life, and the evidence of the fruitless life, there's no fruit on the tree. Jesus says, good, fruit, good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear no good fruit. But sometimes you actually need to evaluate, wow, do, am, I, am I actually filled with the Holy Spirit? Do I believe in the first place? And then on the other side is, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm totally living for my own agenda. I'm doing my own thing. Trying to create the Shire life. Been called to go destroy the ring in Mordor, but no, I'm going to do my own thing where it's safe and happy and where there's meat and food and fireworks. You see how much the suburban life is trying to bend us into that. We can take care of ourselves. But we're called to something far more radical, gifted for something far more radical. So we've got to move on in the parable to find more meaning. But it turns out you don't have to define, because Jesus didn't define, exactly what happened to that servant. So, Jesus says, after, say, after destroying his excuse, he says in verse 24, And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he's got ten minas. That is the normal response. This guy has all of this stuff. Again, it's not money. This is not uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the idea that one of these servants was faithful with the responsibility they were given. Faithful with the responsibility of given. So what did they have? Well, they had faithfulness with that responsibility. What did the other servant not have? He didn't have faithfulness with that responsibility. So what is being given is responsibility that you can decide to be faithfulness. What's going to be taken away? If you be unfaithful with it, that same responsibility. And you see this happen all the time in people's lives. I've been watching this show called All-American Football Show, and it's... Um, about a uh, young black man who grew up in a really broken neighborhood called Crenshaw, and um, his dad left. There's a whole backstory to why his dad left, and there's all these redemptive moments in the show. It's actually a pretty, pretty great show, but um, turns out that his dad left and uh, seems to have never seen any of his football games and missed his entire childhood. Can that dad ever get back the responsibility of being faithful and raising his son? No, he can never get it back. God doesn't turn time back like that. So you had this responsibility to be faithful to raising your children. You had this mina that you were given. If you're like me, you've got five of them and one more on the way. And my daily decision to be a faithful husband and a faithful father with that responsibility is what we're talking about here. But it's just the law of the way God built things that when you decide not to be faithful with the responsibilities God's given you, they pass you by. There are times where he's gracious and you get another shot. Sometimes Christians will think that they've missed their calling. I used to be a personal trainer for a guy who got um, either court-martialed or uh, dishonorably discharged. I think he was for a DUI or something like that. And he believes to this day that 
he missed his calling, he messed up, and he can never get it back, and so there's no way for him to participate. There's no way for him to participate in the, in the, in the, um, in the gospel anymore, and it's not true. There's, just, there's another excuse behind that. It's just not going to be in the military anymore. Maybe that really was God's plan A for him, but there's another way. What if God wants to minister to all those other people who have been court-martialed because of DUIs? And he's the one that says God forgives and he redeems and there's more to life than this. God is the God of second chances. And so it ought not to offend our hearts that God is the God who is going to give more responsibility to those who have been faithful with it. Think about if you have worked in a job and you feel like a boss gave someone a promotion that didn't deserve it. That's the unfair thing. Now, I'm not talking about how these uh, servants actually deserved their promotions. Again, the work that they did was by God's grace in the first place. We're not to claim sufficiency in ourselves, according to Paul in Corinthians again. But, in this case, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken given. Are you unfaithful with the responsibility God's given you? You'll get, more, you'll, get, you'll get even what you had originally, the responsibility taken away. If you're faithful with it, you'll be given even more. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. We have to settle in our hearts that God decides based on Jesus Christ. That's as much as we know. Salvation is based on the distinction of those who accept and reject Jesus Christ. From an earthly standpoint, that's the case. And so, oh, he's going to slaughter people? The fact of the matter is if you decide that Jesus is not good, although he is the foundation of everything that is righteous and good, and you're the one that's not good, it's only just that God would separate you from himself and that you would receive the consequence that he promised, which is death. The enemies of Christ are people who are unrepentantly, continuously doing evil. They're people that crucified him and then were never pierced with the conviction of what they did. You know, a lot of the Pharisees came to faith, according to Acts, afterwards. A lot of them were pierced in their hearts when they recognized what they had done to the Messiah. But many of them continued to be hardened in their hearts. And so that's true. But what I want to focus on today is a, as we end this sermon, is a practical application for you for what it would look like to put your mina to use. And we've got a slide for that. Now these are the five things that you could take with you on this adventure of bearing fruit and being productive and being faithful with the responsibilities God has given you. So let me take my little run-over sermon here and talk about them. The very first one is your station in life. I'm just going to define these. Each one of us has a station in life. As I'm looking out at you, some of you are retired and no longer working. That is a station in life. What's true about people? What have they been given if you're retired? Most often you've been given a lot more time than most. You've put in your time, and now you've got time. And that's a blessing from God. So what are you doing with that time in retirement? You get a lot of retirees. Uh, nothing of anyone here, honestly, because it's just not true of anyone here, that once they retire, I'm going to go to Palm Springs all the time, or I'm going to winter in Arizona, and you're, you're not geographically anchored anymore, and you go here and you go there, and so, well, I guess in the winters, that person just can't be relied upon in the church to be serving anywhere, or they're serving at a completely different church, and they're totally relationally disconnected. Your station in life matters, and you've been given things in every station in life. That's true even if you've been put in prison. You not serve God with your mina in prison? Yeah, you can. Start a Bible study. Prisoners do. People come to faith. Eternal value. Maybe you're single. You're not married. You're in school. Or you're just starting out in your job. You know, again, uh, if you don't have the responsibility of being a husband and a father right now, there's a lot of availability that you have that, trust me, you don't have as much of anymore when you get married and start having kids. Or maybe you're married and you have kids. Are your kids that mina? Oh, sure they are, that responsibility you're to be faithful with. So is your wife, so is your husband. But also your house and the car and all the good things that you have that God has provided for you. What about your job? What about your actual job? Maybe it's just a job to make ends meet. Are there people at your job that you are connected to that nobody else is? Maybe you're the only person who would tell them about Jesus in their whole life. 
maybe the only person that would invite them to church. They might continue to grow in their faith after you told them your testimony and they came to faith. Maybe you're the one that can offer them the kind of encouragement they needed that day, and it's not some big ongoing thing, but it's just being faithful with a little that day. What station do you have in life? It's part of your mina, it certainly is. By the way, there are much, there's much more that you could use to define what your mina is. But your station in life, is it, are you living your own agenda with that station? Or are you thinking about how all of the different things that you've been given in your life, your house, your home, your money, your relationships, those things are all given to you so that you can serve God with them. What about a spiritual gift? That is certainly part of your mina. Probably my favorite part of our minas. Supernaturally powerful gifts that you've been given to help build other people up in love for God and love for one another. I don't know if you've ever been encouraged by someone who has the gift of encouragement. It's just so much more powerful than you'd expect. You walk away from that day. Sometimes someone will say something about my sermon and it just, just fills my whole heart with encouragement. I just like, that's the gift of encouragement. When I was discouraged or just... The enemy was about to attack me and say that sermon was worthless. It's not going to do anything good. But what spiritual gift do you have? You hear about the spiritual gift of hospitality, the gift of mercy, the gift of service, the gift of helps. There's so many different gifts. We don't, this is not a sermon about gifts, but I really believe as an elder, as a preacher, it's, it's partly my job not just to be faithful with my own mina, but to help develop a church and build up a church so that other people would have easy access to be faithful with their minas. So we want to do everything we can to help you discover your spiritual gift, develop your spiritual gift, and deploy your spiritual gift. And we've actually had 9 a.m. sessions where we teach on that and give people resources. If you're interested in those resources, contact me. What about a timely opportunity? Why did I say a timely opportunity? Almost all opportunities you're given by God have their time and their season, and then they pass. Time just keeps marching forward. It never goes backwards. So do you have a timely opportunity right now? Maybe you're caught unaware and not ready for it. You say, God, I'm sorry I was caught unaware and unready for this timely opportunity, but help me catch up right now. I don't want to miss it. What's your timely opportunity? What's your timely opportunity? What about relational influence? By the way, these are things that your mina will always include. It doesn't mean it's exhaustive, but they'll always relate to your station in life, your spiritual gift, your timely opportunity, and relational influence. Turns out, again, the work of the kingdom of God is about the work of Jesus Christ reigning in the hearts of his people by his spirit. It's already relational, it's very nature in the first place. We know that we're to be building people up in love as we speak the truth in love. People think, oh, well, that person's a professional discipler. There are so many people that the professional disciples of the world don't have access to, don't have any relationship to, aren't even the right person to mentor that person. There's just someone in your life that you have spiritual influence with, relational influence with. That's part of your mina. Are you stewarding that influence well? Or, in this case, and I think this is something that happens all too often for us, you know you should be influencing them in a way, but you're worried it's going to harm the relationship, and so you say nothing. Maybe you're worried you're going to say it in the wrong way and it's going to get messed up. Again, one of those things, well, God, I didn't really think you would help me say the right words. It turns out it's not about the right words, it's about the right heart. You come to someone with the right heart, you say the hard thing that you need to say, that might be the way that you apply your mina. And five, a little bit different than the other words, ones, a broader category, God has ordained only one institution in the whole world not to fall to hell, and that's the church. That's the place where people come together as living stones built next to each other on mission for Jesus to go and make disciples. That's the place where these spiritual gifts are to be deployed. That's the place that we are not to neglect the gathering, especially as we see that day when the nobleman comes again to evaluate and to give rewards for those who are faithful. So if you think of your mina, it's definitely going to involve your station in life, it's going to involve your spiritual gift, it's going to involve timely opportunities, it's going to involve relational influence, and If you really want to be faithful with it, it involves the church. And that's where I want to end today. I want to tell you a short story about how easy I believe it is to get involved in Boone's Ferry. There's lots we could do to make it easier. Lots we could do to make it more uh, smooth kind of thing. But um, 
And there's, there's a lot of people, I'm just going to highlight one person in this case, it's, it's Ben Weiss, you see him up here with the cajon. It's just kind of a cool story though. Um, he was feeling led to transition um, from his church to another one, and um, it was kind of the, the heaviest part, the initial part of the pandemic where uh, the vast majority of churches weren't meeting. Uh, one of the reasons we weren't meeting is our sanctuary was in the full renovation swing, and we thought, you know what, um, we feel disconnected from our people uh, in, as elders, uh, so why don't we put this online prayer thing together, we call the elder prayer, and we put a little link that you could join us every 7 a.m. on Wednesdays. And I thought at the time, it'd be kind of cool if some random people joined us, you know, and not even from the church, and they prayed with us. And so we left it open to the world, which is not a normal thing to do. And uh, so one day we're on there, and all of a sudden, didn't know him at that time, Ben pops up, and he goes, hey, is it cool if, I think these were exact words, hey, is it cool if I crash your prayer ministry? <laughs> I was like, yes, it's cool. And he's praying with us about that, you know, he wants to hear a little bit about Boone's Ferry and about that. And he hasn't really missed a prayer meeting since then. He basically became part of our 7 a.m. prayer ministry before he even came to Boone's Ferry. There are so many easy ways for you to get involved. He's now a co-leader in a discipleship community. So if you're looking for ways to get involved at Boone's Ferry, you can get involved in the service. You can talk to Jeff about that. You can get involved in the children's ministry, and, and we do need people down there that are, that are helpers. If it's a matter of significant spiritual responsibility, like being a teacher downstairs or anything where we really need to get to know you first, we ask basically, come to Boone's Ferry and just be here for about six months. Get involved. Start coming on Sunday mornings. Start coming to discipleship communities. Let us get to know you. And, and so we are trying to be wise about not just letting any person into any position. We don't do that. But there's a lot of ways. Sound booth, you see how the uh, slides are, are um, moved through the slides for worship? That's something that we need help with. You can join us for prayer at 7 a.m. We're going to be having new hours for that. You can join the 24-hour prayer time. You can join a discipleship community. There's lots of ways to serve in those discipleship communities. Uh, one, I'll highlight another person. Um, Carolyn came and helped my wife clean our house, which was uh, more of a mess than normal because we had a kitchen renovation. Was it probably a gift of helps or gift of service in action there. Bless my wife was really amazing. And it was to get ready for the discipleship community or small group ministry. So there are so many ways to get involved in Boone's Ferry. Talk to me, talk to an elder, talk to LaDonna, talk to Ben, talk to Jeff. They're here today. If you want to start deploying your mina, there are many ways to do that at Boone's Ferry. But again, let's remember that the motivation for doing so in the first place isn't this white knuckle, well, I want to serve and I want to be blessed, but Jesus gave his life for us. And so we belong to him. He owns us. We are his servants. And why wouldn't we want to be productive for him in his kingdom? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sunday morning. Thank you for the joy of participation in your gospel. I pray that people, as they hear this, and either convicted, encouraged, challenged, consoled, whatever your spirit is doing, that you would work in such a way that they would know exactly what their mina is, that responsibility, and that they would know exactly what it looks like to be faithful and that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and empower them to do so. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.